Good morning. I want to welcome you here to Rock Valley Christian Church. What a beautiful day it is and what beautiful worship that was just to give our lives to God and just to consider the awesome nature of our God and how much he has poured out for us and how much he loves us and to be able to offer that back. I also want to welcome our friends online. I want to say hello to uh, Stephen and Cookie today and uh, people that watch out on the East Coast and I haven't greeted them in a long time, so I want to say hello to them. Uh, they certainly uh, bring a lot of joy to our lives and to the lives of the Hartles, our dear friends who watch online as well, and I uh, want to give a shout out to the Hartles as well. I uh, hope that you're having a wonderful Sabbath day. I'd like to begin uh, today by asking you to turn with me in the scriptures to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Father, we just ask that you would bless us, that you would bless these words that we read today, that you would help us and deepen us with the reality of your presence in our lives. You know, one of the things that that makes becoming a Christian so awesome. And as Kat, you were giving that testimony, just thinking about the realities of that. And Martin, your testimony last night. You know, when, when you have a testimony of a meeting with God, it generally is a very intimate thing. In fact, I don't know if you can have it without some intimacy to it. Because God is a very intimate God. And the things that he does in our lives and the things that he works on or the things that he orchestrates or changes or, or, or is engaged in in our lives, it's not just about changing events. We were praying about suffering and people going through different things and what is it, what is it for and everything. We, we humanly get so focused on wanting changes in circumstances When the purpose of God has been from the beginning to create children in his image. And his people, if we're really going to be intimate with God, if we're really going to embrace the relationship and not look at God like he's little genie in the bottle and we're rubbing to get our wishes, but we're really looking at life and why we are here, we need to see something deeper that God has been showing us from the beginning, from the beginning of the book to the end of the book and in our lives. And that is there is a relationship that he wants with us, an intimacy that he desires that changes us. And the circumstances are just part of the process to bring out different things in us. Because the work he is doing is the work that he did from the beginning when he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And that purpose wasn't just something that he did when he created physically Adam and Eve. It is a purpose that you can read about from Genesis to Revelation that God is bringing sons and daughters to glory of which you are called. And the intimacy of that relationship is how he does it. Through all the circumstances, through the trials, through the tribulations, through the experiences of life, God is wanting to see something deeper in us. You know, when God went to free his children out of Egypt, he could have just gone in, taken them out, and, and removed them from the circumstances of slavery. He could have done it really easily. But would that have been accomplishing what he wanted for them? And you know the answer. What happened? As soon as Moses went in to free the people, what happened? Things got worse for the people. Now they had to go get the straw and they had to go get the stubble to put, make their bricks. It got harder. It didn't get better. But God was trying to work something in a people. And for you and me as Christians, as we read of these stories and these examples, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, all of this was laid out for our admonition that we would see it and that we would not repeat the failings but rather see the process and for you and me to really be living and walking by faith it is having an intimate relationship with God to see his presence in every circumstance and realize that his work is not just to change things 
It's to change us. You know, the sign says prayer changes things. And I think the rewrite is prayer changes you. That prayer is changing you. That God is looking to develop you. And you know, when we sing that song, I stand with arms high, heart abandoned, in awe of the one who gave it all. When you think about the reality of that, you're, you're basically saying, God, whatever it is that you need to do to create me into the image and likeness of your son, that is what I want. And it's always these reservations that we have, this trying to hold back our heart from God, and it creates such angst and pain in our lives. And God is wanting us to grow and mature in the process to see his greatness, to see who he is. And so when God redeemed his children out of Egypt, he did it through signs and wonders to demonstrate who he was for them. And even after he brought them out and they'd gotten freedom through the Passover lamb, all this work he did, they just had to believe that if they put the blood on the doorpost, it would save them. They had to believe that they needed to leave. They had to believe in the things God was telling them. But when he brought them to the sea, and they were pinned in because of the mountains and the sea, and here comes the army of the Egyptians, it was yet again to say, do you know who your God is? And you realize that is the question that we keep needing to ask and answer in our lives. Do we know who our God is? Is God God for us? And the answer is yes, if you want him to be. Because the invitation has gone out to all, to all mankind to let God be God for you. And we are here because God is God for us. And what we want to do is encourage one another to realize the intimacy of this relationship. So God promised when he redeemed a people that he was taking them to the promised land, to a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land flowing with abundance and prosperity. This is always God's desire for his people. His desire is to take us to a place of blessing. The whole reason he created us is to take us to places of blessing in our lives. So here God tells Moses in chapter 13, send out spies to the land, to the promised land. And so he sends them out. Notice, it says, so then verse 17, so Moses sent them to spy out the land, and there was somebody chosen from each of the tribes to go forth and to spy out this land. And he told them, go up in the way into the south, go up into the mountains, see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, And whether there are forests there or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was of the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and they spied out the land. And as we know, they went in and and they found it to be an incredible place. Grapes so huge, it took two men to carry the branches back with the, with the, with the grapes. They were, they were luscious and they were large and the wells and the homes and the villages and the places and They they saw amazing things. So when they came back, verse 26, they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us and truly it does flow with milk and honey and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong The cities are fortified and very large, and moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Remember, the Anak was the, the, those were the giants. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. So, yeah, it's a great place, and there's a whole bunch of people already enjoying it. Then Caleb, it says, verse 30, quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, what? We're not able to go against this people. They are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours 
its inhabitants. And all the people who we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, uh, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword? that our wives and children should become victims, would it not be better for us to return to Egypt, to their place of slavery? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. And then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. And now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Dad stepped in. And before we look any further into this, I want us to think about the realities of what was happening in the lives of the Israelites. They had grown up, all of them, as slaves. Their forefathers had come to Egypt 400 years prior, and now every descendant was born into slavery. And there was no getting out of that slavery because of the power of the Egyptians and the power that they had to dictate what life was going to be, the power to enslave them to do work, to build the dreams of the Egyptians, to basically be at their will for what they wanted. And God went and determined that he was going to take a people out of slavery by his power, by his might, to demonstrate his glory for all. And so he begins to pour out the plagues, and he begins to demonstrate his power. And it seems that sometimes the enemy can mimic that power, and they can turn water red, and they can bring forth serpents out of their own rods. But what was shown throughout was that God's power, even in the smallest of miracles, was still greater. But then he was doing stuff that nobody could mimic, that nobody could compare with. And he did signs and wonders throughout the land of their slavery to demonstrate that he is God. That the Lord, I am Yahweh, the one who was and is and is to come, the one who is the great I am that I am, performed wondrous signs that nobody could deny, including the death of all, where the blood of the lamb wasn't present. And so he freed his people and brought them out. And when they came to that water, they saw their enemy pursue them. And they began to cry out, Oh no, oh no, what are we going to do? Here comes this army. We're nothing against this army. And see, God was trying to show them through every step, with every plague, with all the abundance that they left Egypt with, and coming to the land, that in the very moment that they were afraid for their lives, in the very moment that it looked like destruction was upon them, They didn't see that this was the great blessing in disguise to demonstrate for all to see that he is God and he is in charge and what they saw as destruction coming upon them was about to be the absolute completion of their liberty. They saw the army and were afraid and what God did is basically said, what are you calling out to me for? Go forward. He stretched out the rod The sea was divided. The people went through as in dry land. 
Their enemy was held up by a pillar of fire from God. Then God lets them slip through. He lets them all run into the sea after. And then he just brings down the walls of water. And their captors were killed in the sea. No longer would those people have any power over them. They saw God free them without one of them lifting a sword in defense. They saw the absolute perfect grace and power of God to free them from their oppressor who would want them to be enslaved again. They saw his power over the enemy. And you realize that when they stood on the side of freedom and they saw their enemy crushed in the sea and they praised and sang the song of Moses, you realize that that nation that they had just come from that had held them in captivity for 400 years, that nation's army, its power and strength had been completely decimated. There was no power to hold them any longer. Pharaoh, the horsemen, the chariots drowned in the sea. All the firstborn of that land were killed because they didn't put the blood on their houses. The whole country is in disarray. And you realize the only way that country was taking them back into slavery was if they went and volunteered for it. They had no power to collect them against the power of God. They had to ask for it. So God showed them. And then God made them thirsty, and he gave them water. And then God made them hungry, and he gave them food. And all of these things were to be a witness of his faithfulness and his goodness, that there would be a testimony of who God is that would be remembered, just like you remember in every relationship you have, that the work of the other party what you come to know and expect and have faith in a person, God was giving them a revelation so that they could have faith in him. So when they go to spy out the land that God had already promised to them, and they come back and they are basically scared, terrified, because Tan gave a report that this was not a place to go, that if we go there, they're going to wipe us out. They're bigger, they're stronger, they have fortified cities. We've got no business going into this land. They didn't see what Joshua and Caleb saw. The God who destroyed the Egyptian army is the God who is giving them the promised land. And in our lives, friends, there is all this land before us. There are things that God wants us to inherit. There are places that he wants us to build. There are captives he wants to set free. And sometimes we get so clouded looking at the world and how daunting the problems are in the world. And how do we even begin to make a dent Because we evaluate our strength versus the world and don't realize that what God is looking to his church to do is evaluate his strength versus the world. There's a question that is developed in the life of every single person in this room and every person who will ever live that will come to really have a relationship with God and it is this. Will we weigh the events that are before us, the circumstances that we're in, the life that we are living with God in the picture? Will we set him before our eyes in everything to say, you're my God. You are my everything. You see, the, the heart of faith really is that, isn't it? You... you you go through life and do you see God when the bad stuff happens? Do you see God when the things don't look good to your physical eyes? When you start to evaluate, well, we're this and they're that. We don't have any cities. They've got cities. We got a little bit of armaments. They got a whole bunch. And when we start to evaluate life by the power of the world versus our power of this world, 
Sometimes it looks pretty bleak. And we can be just like these spies that came back and said, it looks hopeless. And when somebody stands up and says, we should go take the land right now. Like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You think you're going to go conquer the world? But you see, what is life if God comes into it? When God comes into the picture, and this is why I said every Christian must face this question, because the question here is, is God your God? Do you see the greatness of his mercy and his grace and his power towards you? Do you see his desire to bless you? Do you know what one of the most beautiful things is that we have a friend, Dale Stogner, who, who uh, likes to write, and, and he, he gives a sermon and this, this talk about how God is the great author and how he writes a story and how God loves a drama. Do you know that this is a whole drama? And it's always been a drama, and your life is a drama for what reason and purpose? To see if you will overcome by the power of the Lamb. To see if you will become the person that God made you to be. And sometimes we need to step out of our own story and say, where's God in this? Is God even in my story? Am I even seeing him? I'm the protagonist in a story that is my life, created and chosen by God. Martin, you read it last night from Ephesians. Before you began, before the world began, God chose you. For what? To be a protagonist in a story, to demonstrate his glory, that we would come to live by faith and know the God who loves us, who made us, and who gave us everything. So we got to step out of life and say, God, who are you? And when you go into your promised land and you're thinking that God's wanting to bless you and give you something and you see all the enemies and you see the challenge and you're like, what are you talking about? We can't do this. To just say, brilliant, but God can. God can and God wills in your life to bring you through the challenges because what God is doing is not seeking to just change your circumstances or changing the things and the events in life, he is looking to develop a people that live by faith, that just shall live by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And our lives are a dedication to be as faithful to God as he has been to us, to be as loving of God as he has been to us. That's why that song, The Stand, is so powerful, because we're saying, God, what did you leave behind when you came and you sent your son to this earth? What did he leave behind? He gave up his power. He gave up his glory. He gave up his dignity. He gave up his reputation. He gave up being worshipped. He came among his own creation, and then his creation didn't even respect their creator. He's walking in the flesh. Jesus left it all out there for us. If you ever feel like you can't give more, I beg of you, look at the sacrifice of Christ from the time that he emptied himself of glory all the way through. Because it is the greatest story of faithfulness and commitment and trust. And you realize that what God is asking, and I say it again, this is the question we all ask his disciples, will we demonstrate the very faith that God had in us when he was willing to risk all, you could say, to come to this earth to die for you and me, to give it all up because he had a belief that we, be, we would become the children of God. Will you risk what he risked to be a child of God? You see, that is the question. That is the heart and the essence of all this teaching that's in Numbers. Will we see God in him, in it all? Will we see God? Will we weigh what is before us in the light of God? That is the question. Will we weigh what is before us in the light of God? Will we allow the weight of his glory to always tip the balances in our scale? We talked about David over the last couple weeks, and I was talking about David, a man after God's own heart, and why God loved his heart. And he realized when he went and, and was going to the army to see what was going on, and Goliath was there, and everybody is scared, and even the king is afraid. David wasn't afraid. 
it wasn't because he was crazy. It was because he knew who his God was. See, that's where the, the little rub and the twist comes from, right? David goes, he's all faithful. His brothers are like, what are you even doing here? Brat, go home. It's dangerous here. Nobody wants to face him. I'll face him. Oh, who are you? Saul says, well, you better put on the armament. It's way too big and heavy. Just let me go get some stones. Those will work for me. Man looks at it always as men. We men and women, we look at it through our eyes and we make evaluations and rationalizations and we somehow think it's wisdom to do so. And look, God gives us intelligence. He wants us to weigh and measure. But there are times in your life when you need to realize that what is going to take you from the place you're standing now to the place you need to progress to is not a matter of your strength and being able to jump, but it's a matter of power of God to skip you along and to carry you on the way that your path goes out to victory because it's God that's marching you forward. The reality is that God is looking to change you and me internally, our hearts and our minds through every experience that we would be changed and then boom, 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 the circumstances can change really rather quickly. But it happens in moments of faith. It happens in moments of belief, in moments of trust. And friends, maybe some of you are just looking for the promised land that is peace in your own heart and mind. Maybe you're looking for the promised land that God offered through Jesus Christ that you would be at a place of stillness in your own heart. And what you find is there's a struggle there because you look at what's going on and you say, how will I ever change this? Because I have vices. I have things that pull me into this world. How will I ever defeat the stronghold? It has been a hold of me for so long. And when God came to set you free, he came to break you of things. The chains, as we sang about, to be broken of the chains of this world, to be set free, to give glory and honor to God, to be a servant of God and of all mankind, and that is your destiny. And you and I get lied to, we lie to ourselves, the biggest lies we tell are the ones we tell ourselves that somehow we can't. Because we look at it under our own strength and power and we see failure and we believe in our failure more than God. Friends, if, if we just step back and look at our lives, you look back, you live long enough, you can look back and you can say, the things that scared me the most... The things that brought, the, brought, the, uh, brought on the most heartache. These are the best things that happened in my life. Because they brought me to where I needed to go before God. To realize that he was wanting me to see. He was always there for me. And through all the pain. And through all the broken pieces of my heart through all the vices to which I was engaged, he could so violently destroy them so that I could be free and his kid. But when God does these things, you read the stories, friends, he lets it play out with drama. And he wants it to play out with drama because therein is the span of time for you and me to choose who our God is. Is our God our failures? Is our God the people that look stronger, the things that look bigger, the things we can't overcome? Or is our God the God of the universe who knows everything about every bit of you, more than you even know yourself, who stands on your side, victorious in power and might, looking for Children who believe that say, you're it for me. See, that's the intimacy of relationship with God. When we talk about that, those aren't just fancy words. We're talking about the stripped down heart that says, God, I love you and I trust you. And no matter what I face in this life, 
my life is to give you glory. And the places that you take me, God, these are the places I want to go. You are my maker. You love me more than I love myself. Your mercy is greater than my own mercy for me. Your compassion for me is greater than my own compassion for me. Your wisdom is so much higher than my wisdom. Your ways are better than my ways. I look to you, my king, and say what you say will happen, will happen. Where I will go, you say it, I will go there, and I believe in you. And I trust that you will do what you say because you're my God. And I in no way want to inhibit you or limit you, the Holy One of Israel, who can so dramatically change me and Scott and Carolyn and Stephanie and every person in this room and every person in this world. There is no limitation to God. And he keeps coming in and inviting and he is persistent and he is powerful. And sometimes we look at this world and we can get so down because of the things that are happening and we can look at the tragedies. Do we not realize it's drama? For the purpose of bringing forth faith and a revitalization of heart and mind and soul, it is through pain. It is through heartache that we become more ready and available. You go out to a garden, and if that garden has been just living as it does with nobody engaging with it, you know what? It's not ready to receive any seed. You drop those seeds, and the soil bounces them back off. It doesn't take. But you know, you take a plow. You take a hoe, and you start to chunk into it. Ouch! It hurts. That soil gets broken. That soil gets chopped up and it starts as big clumps and you work it and it gets smaller and smaller and it becomes granular. And you know what happens is it gets that softness that the earth can get. It becomes so ready to receive a seed. The seed of God's word and the water to drink in to make life a miracle happen because the word of God planted in a life does miraculous things. Hallelujah. We have the opportunity to see the miracles of God around us all the time. <laughs> There's trees out here right now. Why do you think they just should grow? Our God designed those trees. Our God wrote a code that would make those trees develop leaves and branches and a system of strength and vitality that it's, it's bizarre when you think about it, isn't it? We get so used to the miracles around us, we forget that God's been showing us our whole lives. Guys, look around you. Look around you and see. I do the miracles all the time. God wants us to be those who see, those who recognize, those who love. So when the congregation took up stones because they wanted to stone Caleb and Joshua because they had faith in God more than the people of the land and they were so angry with them, they wanted to kill them. I mean, think about that. The heart, the mind. We are so destined for destruction. We want to kill you for saying we wouldn't be. Do you ever have that in your life? Where when you have a statement of faith and God is leading you, it almost seems like people get angry because you believe. When I first started Fresh Concepts, my brother's idea, he was the founder. He called me to quit college, to leave college, to come home to start a business that had never been done in the history of mankind. It's kind of weird to say that, but it's true. Nobody had ever done it before. It was a brand new idea. And people that we knew in the industry, people that we respected, when we said what we were going to do, you know what they said? That will never work. You are wasting your time. This is foolishness. It'll never happen. And I remember listening to one guy that I really did respect. And boy, was he hard on my brother. And I was listening to the conversation. And, you know, we never got daunted at that. Because we really thought that this would work. Because there was so much right behind it. 
And that if we dedicated it to God, well, then it could be successful. And it's amazing how that work, for me personally, I'll speak for me personally, that business has changed my life in so many ways. And I really think it wasn't the business. It was just the vehicle that God used in my life to develop me and train me to go through heartache, to go through loss, to go through blessing, to go through gain, to go through adversity, to go through things that were fearful, to look at enemies that were bigger and more powerful. When billion-dollar companies say, we're going to go up against you, we're going to put you out of business, we're going to make it so that you can't function anymore, we went through a lot. And I remember when we would go through these experiences, and people remind me sometimes because in 1999, it looked like that wasn't going to happen. This business started in 87. I left school in 89, and in 99, it looked like it was done. It looked like we had finally hit the place where, well, we're out. We were being attacked, literally, by people that first wanted to buy us. They entreated, and when we didn't receive, they attacked, and they had deep pockets, and they did everything to discredit us, to discourage us, and to ruin what had been built. And going through that experience, at the time, I can just tell you how sick, it felt like waking up and getting punched in the stomach, and guys, you know that feeling, right? That, ugh, that feeling when somebody just really gets you good, and it just hurts, and you just feel that way. And you're like, they're so against me. And I even had a, 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 one of the people calling me up to laugh, to gloat, and to tell me he's doing it, and I did it to these customers, and they're leaving you, and now I'm going after these customers, and they're going to leave you, and I'm going to wipe you out. And going through that experience of having somebody literally trying to attack you and attack your family and attack what you have and the things that you were building and realizing these things that happen in life of attack that you can't control. I have no control on these things. But then to say, but you know what? I'm not here for that business. I'm here for God. I need God to provide for me, and I know he'll make the way. And whatever happens to me and this, I am here in California because God led me to come to California because he wanted to use me in my life in California for his purpose and his will. And whether I have this business or not, it is not for that that I am here because I was made and predestined before the world began to be David, the child of God, to live for all eternity, to know the hope of glory, and that is my purpose. And whatever may come in this world and in this life, he is God. And either he is God or I think I am, and guys, I ain't. I ain't. Glory to God. And so, the next time that guy called me, I was ready to bless him. To say, have you said what you needed to say? Yes. May the Lord bless you. And I'd hang up the phone and I'd pray. That man needed prayer. That man needed help. But who was really getting changed from those phone calls? Right here. To know the intensity of attack and to pray for it by obeying the word that Jesus said, I changed. Faith is going in and reading what God says and knowing that he tells us for our own good and not only agreeing with the truth, but then actually practicing the truth Amen. and expecting that it's true and expecting that God will be God for you through it is exactly what he's looking for in all of our lives. Friends, if we could just sum up faith, if we could just really grow 
uh, grab hold of what's going on in our lives and just really get around it. If you're feeling pressed, if you're feeling tribulation, if you're feeling trial, if you're feeling pain, if you're feeling the things of this life and what you're going through in the circumstances, get God in there so deeply. Get God in the midst of it so deeply and say, God, I can't. I leave it to you. I seek grace to help in time of need. I seek you in everything. Be God for me. And our cry and our prayer, when we get on our knees, be God for me. Show me that you're God. Yes. Oh, that more children would be in this room crying out. They all leave when I preach, so, you know, I, I get it. I understand. But, friends, this is the, it's the humility of a child, which is the strength of a man, to acknowledge the goodness of God in his life. It is the great wisdom to acknowledge the goodness of God in everything, to weigh our situations by the glory of God and not just by the weight and strength of mankind. Is he God or not? Is he God for you or not? Is he the one that's in your life ruling? Do you expect him to take a hand for you? Because the most beautiful thing that happened in those moments, and like I said, I look back and I thought, I just moved to California. I'm going to lose my job. I don't know where I'm going to work. It's a lot more expensive to live here than it was in Illinois. My wife has quit work. She's taking care of our kids. We're trying to do the right things. Help. Help. We lost every single piece of business that we had from 1998 to 2000. Every client we had went away in a span of less than two years. It was a do-over. You can look at the different sections of your life. You can look at your personal life. You can look at the way you live, the way you act. You can look at your business and different things. But it's so amazing when you look back and you just say, there you were, there you were, there you were, there you were, there, there you were huge right there, huge, huge, awesome, tremendous. Praise you, God. Praise you. Turn with me over to Psalms, chapter 16. Psalms chapter 16, notice this in verse 7. It says, I will bless the Lord Yahweh, who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Friends, what I'm asking us to do as individuals, as a congregation, is to set the Lord always before us. To evaluate all that is before us through him, through his power, through his mind, through his works, to set him before us that he would be the one. Notice this again. I set the Lord always before me, verse 8, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. And my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now this was the prophecy that was read uh, and quoted by Peter when he first gave that sermon. After the Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost. He gave this, he quoted these verses because Jesus was the one who gave up his life 
talk about drama. One who was in the beginning, who was with God and was God, who gave up life. But he had a promise from God that he would not leave his soul in Sheol, in the grave, nor would he allow his Holy One to see corruption. But after three days and three nights, he raised him from the dead. See, sometimes we can look back and we can read the story and we say, well, yeah, but we know the outcome. We can read the story and we see that, yeah, you're right, David. The Israelites got the help they needed. Yeah, we can read the story. We know that he was resurrected. Yeah, we can read the story. We can know how it turned out. Okay. You've read the story. Why don't you think it applies to you? Your story is the same story. Are you not promised victory? Are you not promised eternal life? Do you not have the hope of forgiveness? Do you not have the hope of the resurrection? Do you not have the hope of promise? Do you not have it? Isn't your story been written? What God is looking for is for us to engage in the story of faith, of love, and of hope in him. To engage in the story. And what happens is we have these trials and these tribulations and where the lie of the enemy is, is trying to knock us off the path to get us to doubt God, to get us to doubt his goodness, to get us to doubt that he'll help us, to get us to doubt that he's involved. And God keeps crying out in his word as we look over and over, I'm right here. A sparrow doesn't fall, but the Lord knows it. How much more are you? He knows every hair on your head. Do you? Martin does. But the, the, but the, sorry, Martin, that was just was shiny at that moment. It was just, the, God knows. God cares. God loves. And he's wanting us to accept that love. Without belief in God's love for you, life is going to be a very difficult place. But with belief and trust in his love for you, it becomes an amazing place and an amazing story and journey that your life goes on by which he is taking you to perfection. His desire is to perfect us in Christ Jesus. That's his purpose, his plan, to create us in his image and likeness which is perfect to bring us to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Behold what manner of love the Father has poured upon us that we should be called the children of God. Behold that love. And to know it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Not as men and women, but as children of the Most High God. And you see the path that is laid before you and the path that God has and he's wanting us to go upon and take. Turn with me to uh, Psalm chapter 21. Psalm chapter 21. The king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord. Friends, God wants you to engage with him in partnership in your life and in your story. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He wants to finish the faith, and what he's looking for is us to be submissive to that change and that transformation. Whether it is that we need to forgive our spouse, whether it is that we need to be humble before our neighbor, whether it is that we need to have faith in him and what he will do and accomplish in provision for us or protection for us or in whatever manner of life that we see God in everything, that we set the Lord before us. And the king says, again, Psalm 21.1, the king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength and we shall have joy in his strength because we're saying, I'm looking to you to take a hand for me in every way of my life. I know that you want to be involved, and I'm welcoming you to be involved. Now, does that get you excited to think of God taking a hand in your life? This is a work of faith that according to your faith, let it be done unto you. Think about God. He's saying, I want in. And he's saying, let me in. And you say, come in. And now he's engaged. 
And the engagement gets God going in the areas of life. And here's what's beautiful. When God wants it to go faster, he can make it go faster. When God wants to pull it back, he'll pull it back. If he needs to build patience, he'll do that. If he needs you to do some work for somebody else, he'll speed up. He controls time. He controls purposes. He controls plans. He controls everything. And the world becomes a different place for you and me when we give up the control of our lives and put our lives into God's hands and say, direct my paths, lead me in the way everlasting. I make you God in my life. I want you in everything. And so it says, the king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, and in your salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. Salah. I had a chance to talk with uh, my son Jack this morning and just recounting because the business that I thought was going to die didn't die. It grew strong. And I look back and I say, for 25 years of marriage, it has provided for me and my wife and for our kids the homes we've lived in, the food we've eaten, the clothes we've worn, the trips we've gone on, and the ability to have enough extra for somebody else. He used that vehicle. But, but I sold that business. And people have asked me, well, how is it to sell a business after you've been involved and it's been that vital to you for so long? And I'll say, you know what? I've had moments of a little mm, remorse maybe. the thing that made it so special to me was not the business or the corporation. It was the God who was my business partner and who is my business partner today who drives my life. And that is what it means to me. It wasn't about what I was doing or where I was living or how it was going. It was always God. And he showed up in ways. And I I was telling my son, I said, Jack, when those times were rough, and I would say, God, give me that client, and I would pray the client by name, and I would get that client. And then I would say, give me that client. That's a good one for us. And I'd always say, if it's not a good one, you see something I don't see, don't give it to me. But if it's a good one, give it. And I did that multiple times with God. Multiple times I was able to pray a specific prayer for a specific thing. And it's like this verse. You have given him his heart's desire. You have not withheld the request of his lips. And even to the very sale and to the very price of the sale, I asked for a number. And for me, it was a big number. And I got it. And he's just showing off again. And I dig it. I want God to show off and show his power in my life. It's the intimacy of that, though, to say, here's what I want, God. If it's good for me, please give me this. And if it's not good, thy will be done. I don't want it. Every time I pray, I pray that prayer because Jesus taught me to pray that prayer. I'm teaching you to pray that prayer. Be specific in your prayers. Be specific for the things because God looks at these things and says, okay, that's what you want. Let's work to make it happen. God is looking for a relationship with you. You were created to have fellowship with the Almighty. Does that not in itself blow you away? And to say that he wants to be engaged in your life and to show up as God is amazing. And guys, I'm talking about a business. I can tell you so many stories of my life from the miracles that I've seen. It would take books. It would, I don't even know where to begin when I look back at my life and say, that was awful. My mother, she was in, she was in hospitals basically from the time I was born to the time I was 15. She was in and out of hospitals the whole time. And somebody had faith enough to pray for her in the name of Jesus. And when I was 15, she was healed. And nobody believed it. The doctors didn't believe it. My father the brothers, the people, we were all like wondering, well, I don't know, you know, she's been sick for this long. 
So they said, how are you going to prove it, Lila? She said, I'm t- going off all my medication. I'm not going to drink any more caffeine, and I'm going to pray every day and study God's word. And you'll see in three weeks, I don't need any of it. So he wouldn't let her out of the hospital. But three weeks later, he's like, got to let you go. You aren't sick. And she's out. And then she does what? She doesn't just get out and have the healing for herself. She then just begins to use the power and the liberty that God gave her with her health. And she begins serving in ways that people are like, Lila, you shouldn't be doing that. That's way too much for somebody like you to take on. And my mom would always be like, yep, but it's not too big for God. And that's the way she lived her life. Her relationship with God was evident. It was manifest. And her life changed. And the way she lived changed. And everything about her changed because the engagement of God was revitalizing to her. And I can look back in that life, my life and I say, what a witness, what a testimony, God, that I got to watch that. I got to see you. And when she would say, David, you need to give first portion of everything you make to God. You need to dedicate it to him and make him part of your life did that. You know what? People would say, David, you're crazy because you were paying out first tithe and then you were paying out second tithe so you could go to the Feast of Tabernacles. You were paying out third tithe so widows and orphans. Staff, did we ever go without a meal? When we were making 400 bucks a week and scraping by? Never without a meal. Never without a blessing. Never without help. God came through every single time. I can give witness and testimony that if you ask God to bless you in your life and you have faith to do what you say, that's not logical. But God, you are. You do it. We keep trying to play games with God and restrict his power in our lives. We limit the Holy One because we won't do what he says. He says, test me, try me, and see if I won't pour out a blessing for you. And people do. I say, look, the laws are pretty simple. Six days you work. Seventh day you rest. Give God a tenth of what you have. Make a deal with him. Partner with God. He wants you to partner with him. Do you see that? You say, hey, I'm having trouble overcoming stuff. I'll tell you what, nobody in this room that I know of was any worse of a TV-aholic than I was. I was a terrible TV-aholic. I'd come home, when I first was working, I'd turn on that TV, and I just couldn't get that remote out of my hand until it was time to go to bed. It just seemed like you got to keep flipping the channels. And I was so addicted to that and watching all these sitcoms and these shows and ha-ha. And I learned how, hey, one's not enough. Can I watch two shows at the same time? You get really good. <laughs> Remember those days, guys, with the flipping? Oh, man, I could get three going. I could watch baseball, football, and a movie at the same time. Just keep flipping back and forth because you're waiting for every little moment of commercial to flip back around. And when I begged God to free me of that, when he showed me, David, is this the way you want to spend your life? So I was working 30 hours a week. I was not much engaged, but TV was important. And I felt miserable because the very life that he gave me to be productive with was just being blown away. And I know some of us in this room, we may not be flipping the channels anymore, but we got our DVRs and our Netflix and stuff. A little entertainment is fine, my friends, but if that is a characterization of your life, and I've talked to some people within the sound of my voice that have told me they're watching when we really went through it, 30, 40 hours a week, blowing away. It's just vanity. I actually turned on, I I used to be so addicted, I just, I I had to go through a period where I just couldn't turn it on, but what really changed me was, instead of flipping on the TV after dinner, was, was, was going out to pray. It was turning on worship music. It was focusing in a different way. And you know what was so amazing? All the rest that I thought I would get from television and the vegging, hoping that you'd feel better, never really got it. That was the lie. But when I would start going into the word and worshiping and praying, you know what would happen? I'd feel so alive because the relationship with God was better. Movie, TVs, they couldn't compare. And they don't. So last week I was sitting down on the couch and we were doing something. I just turned on a a, a sitcom. I don't even remember what the name was. Two women. And and, and I, I started watching. Not only did it, it not entice me to want to watch, 
it just repulsed me, the whole thing of it. Because I realized through all this insanity, this oversexed dialogue, this, it, it, I felt dumber watching it. It was just, it was just so, it was the worst of mankind. If you're feeding yourself spiritual junk food, mental junk food, I would ask you to take it to God and look and just have him give you something that tastes good, something that really is going to nourish your spirit and your soul. Amen. You weren't made to be a tv holic You were made to be a child of God. You were made to be a prince and a princess in the kingdom. You were made to be a person of influence to bring the glorious gospel to someone else like Kat was explaining go through a process of life to say, where do you want me to go, Lord? And that be it. That's the wholehearted nature. Everything else is just a lie. God is the true. He is the one. And he wants us to know. He wants to answer our prayers. So he says here, back to Psalm 21, for you meet him with the blessings of goodness. Wow. See, we need to get a clock back on that wall. I'm sorry but I'm finishing. You meet him with the blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold upon his head. He asks for life from you, and you give it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great in your salvation. Honor and majesty you have placed upon him, for you have made him most blessed forever. You have made him exceedingly glad with your presence, for the king trusts in the Lord and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall never be moved. That's what I want for you. That's why I gave this sermon. That's why God speaks to you through his word. He wants you to be happy and joyous and blessed. He wants you to know the goodness of being in his presence and to know the relationship that comes from him. And he wants you to be intimate with him. And he wants you to let cast your cares upon him. And he wants you to grow in power and might and fulfill the purposes and the plans that he had when he thought of you before the world began. And friends, if you are in any need of help in prayer, my desire is not to just teach. My desire is to minister to you in the Holy Spirit to ask for the Holy Spirit to help you in whatever way. And if it's just in giving praise and thanks and blessing, we're here, the servants team. In fact, the servants team who prays, come up here. Please come up here. And I want to ask the worship team to come on up too. If you are in need of prayer, we have asked people to step up as our servants team to be helpers in prayer. If you're coming here and you say, I just want somebody to pray with me because I had a great week and I want to bless and thank God with somebody. I want to share it. If you're needing help, if you're needing anything, there's people here that will pray. And so I just want them to come up here so you can see who they are. And I'm asking the worship team to come on up and let's get ready and let's worship God. But if you need prayer for anything, come and ask. We are a church that doesn't just talk in the theory about what God can do. We are a church that believes in who God is and what he will do, and we want him involved. What leads us to prayer is a belief that he will answer the things that we ask for. Faith is living with an expectation that this is true, that God is true, and that it will come about in your life. Let's praise him.